Good morning, folks. Good morning. My name is Sherwood Willow. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank Paige and the library staff for inviting me here today to make this presentation. I trust you will gain a little bit of something about the book that I'm, I'll be covering with you. Um, I'm not brand new to Mount Olive. I was born on the Bentonville battlefield. Someone just said they have a connection to Bentonville. Uh, but now I want you to know that was long after the war, okay? <laughs> the war took place. Uh, I attended Grantham School, if you've ever heard of Grantham, for 12 years. A tenant farmer, we moved around often. As a young teenager, my friend Preston Sasser and I would drive, hitchhike all the way to Mount Olive. For what? To see a movie or to shoot pool on Center Street. I think they had two pool rooms back here in the 1950s. Okay, uh, the book is what I'm here to talk about this morning. Some of you have copies, some of you have seen it, some of you know a little bit about the story. It's called Two to the Grave, Three to the Gallows, The Whirling Murder Story. A true story that took place near, about halfway between Princeton and Grantham, North Carolina. Uh, have any of you ever heard of the slaying of Happy Snipe? That's a silly question for me to ask. Well, mm -hmm. uh, now that you're here as a group, I know that some of you know a lot about this murder. Uh, do any of you have a connection? That's my next question. Uh, sure. Raise your hand if you're a descendant of the murdered couple. You see how many people are here? I'm an outlaw. Outlaw. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure they, they uh, agree to you. Do you like our sister? Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, if you, you may know these names, I call a couple of names of people otherwise that you may know. The Reddies <coughs> and Thorntons, all around Colby Hill, just about every one of them is a descendant of this murdered couple. And from around Seven Springs, some of you may know these names, uh, Rhodes, Rayford, and Moyes, from around the Seven Springs area, uh, Indian Springs. I'm going to share a few highlights of the book with you today. And uh, I, after that, I'll leave a few minutes for questions should you have any. The murder took place in a small log cabin near the Johnson Wayne County border, just off Ferry Bridge Road, which runs through the New Silence I just mentioned, basically uh, a swamp land if you want to know the truth about it. If you're a historian, you remember that the last battle of the Civil War had been fought just up the road from this murder location in 1865. The South surrendered and the, and the slaves were freed. Twelve years after that surrender, on a cold winter night of February the 11th, 1878, three of those former slaves, Noah Cherry, Harris Atkinson, and Robert Thompson, stormed into the Worley cabin and murdered Mr. Worley with a club, finished him off with an axe. Allegedly, all three raped Kathy, his wife, before axing her to death. Three days later, the Goldberg Messenger and the New York Times newspapers described it as the most heinous crime ever committed in the state of North Carolina. And at that time, it quite possibly was. What made the case even more tragic was that three little orphan girls were left behind under the age of five, never to live together as sisters again. Over almost a half a century since the murder, or a century and a half, stories have varied as to what really happened on that night. My goal in writing the book was to try and publish a work that would clear up any misgivings, both about the murder and the trial that followed. Why did I have the interest to start with? Well, I spent most of my growing up years in the Corbett Hill section, about nine miles from where we're sitting today. Have any of you ever bought goat cheese at Holly Grove Farms? That lady has, so you know where. That was one of the residences I had when I was a child. Instead of where the kid goats are now playing, this kid was playing on the same turf, and there was a house there that had now been destroyed and taken down. You remember I told you, I'm a friend of the family. In relation to Indian Britt? Yeah, I told you he's my uncle. Oh, okay. Yes, you probably didn't hear that. Well, some of, uh, and I was, my neighbors, you know, as kids, like you did as kids, we would all get together and play. And, and that was our playground, that very spot that those goats are running around on now. 
uh, we had a bunch of little boys my age and some very pretty little girls. Some of those pretty little girls were great grandchildren of the murdered warriors. So I've known about the story ever since I was eight or nine years old. There were five daughters of Ed and Letha Hatzel Gray, namely Jewel, <coughs> Joyce, Mona, Myrna, and Barbara. So which of the three little orphans did those girls descend from? Most of you sitting here know. Poor Francis, who was the second child orphan. Three years old she was. Poor had been adopted by a prominent family near what is called Indian Springs by former Civil War soldier Atlas Rhodes and his wife, Spicy West. Spicy West grew up in Fort Oaks. She'd been your step great great grandmother, I guess is one reason for the adopted. Several well known citizens of Wayne, of Wayne County are descendants of the same Atlas and Spicy Rhodes, including these names. Sandra Rayford McCullen, Judy Rayford Moy, Jan Carey Cobb, Mary Emma Stevens, and Larry Jeanette. I could go on and on. There's hundreds of descendants. And those descendants of who? Who? They're descendants of the Rhodes family that adopted Cora Francis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when Cora came of age, she married Ed Gray from around Seven Springs. They bought several acres of land in the same Corbett Hill area that I have just mentioned, <coughs> where they lived until they died. By the way, they're buried in a cemetery right on the plantation that they bought in those days, along with about 30 other descendants. Cor had 14 children. Sadly, only half of them lived to be adults. Chapter 5 of the book is a reproduced copy of a small book published by Julius Bonnets owner of the Goldberg Messenger. He gives graphic details of the trial. The three accused were found guilty and hung at the Wayne County Courthouse <coughs> with several thousand citizens there to witness it. They came in by the train loads from all the counties around Wayne. During the trial, no concrete evidence was ever produced. Why then were the, they sentenced to death? A fourth man, black man named Jerry Cox was arrested in the, in, during, during the investigation. However, Jerry decided to turn state's evidence against those three, and after the trial, he went scot-free. Everyone, including black and white citizens and members of the legal profession, thought he was just as guilty as the three that were hung. After the hanging, Sheriff Grantham ordered Cox to get out of the state and never return to Wayne County. Were the three guilty, I ask again? After all the research I've done, I cannot give you a definitive answer. The trio of black defendants knew their fate rested in the hands of a 12-man all-white jury. Near the beginning of the trial, one of the leading lawyers of the state addressed that jury. He said, gentlemen of the jury, we're about to enter upon the most important case ever tried in Wayne County and one of the most important ever tried in the United States. The state does not ask for a conviction unless she fully establishes the guilt of these prisoners at the bar. And who was that lawyer? none other than William T. Deutsch. I believe it was his representation as one of the leading lawyers of the state that sealed their fate. The book is more than a murder story. It is replete with history. Some of the best legal minds and doctors in North Carolina took part in the trial. Chapter seven contains biographical sketches on several of them. And I'm gonna share a little bit of a sketch on these gentlemen as I go along here. Already mentioned William Theophilus Storch. He has a historical marker standing on Ash Street in Goldsboro. Some of you have driven by, most of you have probably driven by that, that fact. He served in both houses of the, uh, of the legislature in Raleigh. And when the Civil War broke out, he was appointed one of two senators to represent North Carolina in the Confederate government up in, uh, in Virginia. 
Richmond. <clears throat> William E. Clark. Clark was a state senator and assistant solicitor during the trial. Years after the trial, he died tragically by along with two young daughters in the New River, near your newborn home. And you'll find these sketches of all of these people in the book, more, much more expanded. Swift Galloway, defense attorney for Robert Thompson, one of those who was hung. Confederate military officer. He was commandant of the Salisbury Confederate prison, lawyer and later solicitor. He was brilliant in his presentation in the courtroom. He's buried in Snow Hill. <laughs> David A. Grantham, the high sheriff of Wayne County at the time of the trial and murder. He was a staunch defender for the accused for the right of a fair trial instead of a lynching, which often happens in those days. He grew up in the community named after his family, Grantham. This is where I grew up myself, as I told some of you. He was a Confederate soldier. On December the 9th, 1886, the Goldsboro Messenger published these remarks, among others. There is no man in the county who is today as popular as David A. Grantham. By the way, he served some 12 years as sheriff of the county, a loved man. The home that the sheriff was raised in was built in 1851. It still stands at Grantham and is one of the loveliest homes there. Residing in that home today is the daughter of Major League Baseball coach, Jerry Nairn. Some of you have heard of the Nairn family, all baseball leaders. Dr. John Kennedy was a physician who first examined the bodies. He was also a Grantham native. When the war ended, Kennedy was a personal bodyguard to President Jefferson Davis. He was well acquainted with Appy James Snipes' family. A quote from the book by Dr. Kennedy during the trial. It was a moon, a bright moonlight night, I know, for I was out on professional business. I knew Mrs. Worley well, have known her for four or five years. She was a fine specimen of a country woman. She was five feet six inches high and powerful, powerful, but not over fleshy being all muscle and bone. Now, several years after the murder, and I found this very interesting because if I had written the book two years ago, I would not have known this. But uh, sometime after the, after the murder and the, and the trial and everything was over, Dr. Kennedy adopted two of Happy James Snipes' half siblings. He adopted a little three-year-old boy named Z.B. Snipes, and the half-sister, Nancy. Any of you know Glenn Kennedy at Grantham? Nobody knows Glenn Kennedy. Glenn Kennedy's a cousin of mine. He was a Wilford fan. But he, he is also a great-grandson of Dr. Kennedy that we've just discussed. John D. Kerr, or Carr, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and I hope the camera will excuse me, but I just have to take care of this for a minute. <laughs> John D. Kerr was de defense attorney for Harris Atkinson, one of the men that was hung. He was a second generation native of, Kerr, of the Kerr family of Black River, which is all around Clinton. And I think I heard somebody here say, some of you live around there. He was a Confederate soldier being commissioned as a captain at the age of 17, the youngest ever in the entire Confederate army. Dr. George L. Kirby, who was the coroner of the county, Confederate military officer and surgeon of the 2nd North Carolina Regiment. For years, he was a highly respected medical doctor in Wayne County. He was later appointed director of the State Mental Hospital in Raleigh, serving that capacity until he died in 1901. Dr. Kennedy still has descendants living around Goldsboro, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Kirby. A quote from Dr. Kirby during the trial. I arrived at the scene of the murder about 3.30 o'clock on Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening. I came the back way and saw Worley first, lying near the chimney. There was a deep wound on the right side of his face, on the neck, and on the lower jaw. The skull was smashed in. He was broken in several places. Some of you may know a young man named James Spicer, lives in Goldsboro. 
Dr. George Kirby was his great grandfather. Then the Honorable L.J. Moore, Leondis Moore, was a solicitor for the trial. One of the leading criminal lawyers in the state of North Carolina, also a veteran, Army veteran of the Civil War. George Tate Wasson, defense attorney for Noah Cherry. Noah Cherry was thought of as being the ringleader. In fact, the newspaper editor, Mr. Julius Bonnets, coined the phrase, the Cherry Gang. And over the years, that was always meant the Cherry Gang. Uh, but anyway, George Tate Wasson was the only black involved in the murder trial, other than the accused and several witnesses who, of course, were black. He was a prominent attorney residing in Goldsboro, at the same time serving as a lieutenant colonel in a local color guard unit. Judge John Kerr, the presiding judge over the trial, was a prominent attorney, district court judge, a legislature, and staunch defender of slavery. A quote from John Judge Kerr as the trial ended. The sentence of the, of the court is that you three, Noah Cherry, Robert Thompson, and Harris Atkinson, be taken from the courtroom back to jail by the sheriff of the county, there to remain till Friday the 14th of June, and then that you be taken by the sheriff to the place appointed by law for the execution of criminals, and that you and each of you be there between the hours of 10 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Be hanged by the neck until you be dead, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Ironically, Dr. John Brian Kennedy and Dr. George L. Kirby and Swift Galloway, three that I've just given you a sketch on, Confederate soldiers were all present during the Battle of Malvern Hill. However, among the thousands of troops engaged in that battle, it is highly unlikely that they were aware, aware of each other's presence or even knew each other. Even if they had been acquaintances, could they have fathomed that 16 years later they would occupy the same space in a small Goldsboro courtroom? taking part in the trial of three former slaves. Statement in question, were all three of the so-called Cherry Gang guilty? <laughs> you will notice that on the book's cover, there's a question mark with a balance, scale of balance. Uh, and uh, that question mark, of course, still rings in my mind. I'm going to share statements made by all three of the accused just prior to their necks being snapped. Listen carefully. I'm speaking to you now as my audience and see what you think of their guilt after I read those. And this is just some preliminary writings that were there. Afterwards, Mr. Griffin, a colored preacher, knelt in prayer in which the prisoners took an impassioned part. part. During the prayer, he was interrupted by the exclamations of the prisoners, Noah Cherry, and the other is breaking in with, Lord, give me assistance, for I need it now. Jesus, have mercy upon me. Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner. All of the condemned appeared to appreciate the kindness shown to them and were much affected. Noah Cherry in particular was crying bitterly. On a previous visit, Mr. Griffin, Mr. Griffin, Noah, and Harris had said they had a weight upon their shoulders and their hearts to get rid of. And on the last night, they said they had got rid of it and were prepared to meet their God. Statement from Noah Cherry. Noah said, Old Noah is to be hanged today for nothing on God's earth. Everything that had been said about Noah and the world is wrong. I never saw that Jerry Cox that night. Never saw him from February the 8th to the 17th. <clears throat> all that was printed and all said in the court during the trial was false. I am just as fear of killing Jim Worthy, Worthy as the judge who sat in that courthouse. My heart is clear. I have nothing to be, I have done nothing to be in prison for. 
<coughs> and certainly nothing to be hanged for. This much is true. Jerry Cox put this on us. He done it and did good business in clearing himself. He is about to have three innocent persons put to death. Harris Atkinson rose and addressed the crowd. From his first sentence and the manner of its delivery, it was evident that he was in an ill humor <clears throat> and his entire remarks invinced an absence of that Christian charity which should have animated one about to enter into the great future. Harris said, It is lies put upon me here, a lie made up by Jerry Cox, and white people help make up his evidence. I see them looking at me now, and I will give their names if I have time given me to speak. Lots of them have been in prison since I've been here and try to be my, admired for Jerry Cox's testimony. I think I can show how Jerry Cox came to fix it on me. Atkinson, that same Harris Atkinson, on mounting the scalpel, said he expected to take his breakfast where? In hell. He said he knew that Jerry Cox killed Worley because he saw him do it. He said that Jerry Cox ought to be standing where he was right now. Robert Thompson was a little more gentle in his approach throughout the whole trial than the murders, uh, the third one that was hung. Robert Thompson, who during all of this had sat surveying the crowd and paying but little attention to the remarks of Nolan <coughs> Harris, then spoke. He said, I suppose this is the last time that we will be together. And I hope to tell the truth why I'm standing on the gallows now that I'm about to die, and that will be soon. I am accused of Jerry Cox killing of the Worlies. He ought to be sitting right where I'm sitting. Jerry Cox told his grand a lie, as ever was told. I don't know who killed the Worlies. I am on the gallows, but I believe Jerry Cox did. I don't know about Noah and Harris, but I clear Bob Thompson. I've got to meet my God, and that before many minutes. And I want to meet him in truth. I have made my peace with God. In the closing pages of the book, I have devoted a short chapter to each of those three little girls who were orphaned. The oldest, Matilda, was four years old, raised by an aunt and uncle. Poor Francis, whom many of you descend from, three years old, was adopted by the Rhodes family, and Celia, whose name was changed to Lula when she was adopted by a Fitzgerald couple, grew up in Pine Level. So what of interest would the story be to folks of Southern Wayne County, especially Seven Springs of Mount Olive? When Cora became of age, she married Edward Grady from Seven Springs. They eventually bought several acres of land in Corbett Hill, built a house, and raised a large family. Cora bore, as I mentioned, 14 children. Apparently, the slain Appy Jane Snipes Worley was a beautiful woman. You ever heard anything about how beautiful she was? If you read some things. Was that beauty passed on to female? Some of you pretty girls can probably answer yes. Was, was that beauty passed on to females of future generations? Dr. Kennedy, who was a physician, uh, the first to first examine the body had alluded to what a lovely woman she was, as I have already read. A newspaper reporter from St. Louis, who was sent here to cover the trial, described her as though he were writing a movie script. He said, she was a picture of strength and health, and at the church fairs and holiday parties, her fine form towered above the smaller figures. Of other, uh, of other country maidens, like the waving and graceful, graceful, graceful cypress in the wild cedars of the forest. Thus, a flower of Amazonian beauty, she was termed voluptuous. Can you see that in the movie script? <laughs> <laughs> okay, is it possible that Appy's beauty was then passed on to future generations? I've already asked that question. 
Let me share a couple of things with you. Can you see that? This young lady is Willa Owen, who would be a distant cousin of all many of you sitting here. A 1944 graduate of Nahanta High School in Wayne County. She was the granddaughter of Matilda, the oldest child of the murdered Abby Jane. As a high school senior, she was named the prettiest and most popular girl in her class. Bear with me while I turn the page. See the beauty in this young lady? This young lady is Lula Paul Hahn. She was the granddaughter of Lula, who was a little baby girl, eight months old, suffering at her mother's breast when, she, when her mother was killed. Um, she and her husband are buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And she has a grandson who has come to a book signing over in Goldsboro for me, David Hobbs. This young lady, I asked some of you a while ago if you knew her. This young lady is the former Joyce Gray, who married once Fred Hood from Grantham, and then she remarried, and today she is known as Joyce Parker. She's the granddaughter of the orphan three, little three-year-old. She lives at Grantham still, attends Fallen Creek Baptist Church. She was tabbed as the best all-around girl in her class in high school. This young lady is Joyce's sister, Myrna. Myrna and I graduated together. We're, we're two of the little kids that used to play on that grass where the goats are running today. She was my next door neighbor. She was a beautiful woman when she died four years ago. As a senior, she was voted the most popular girl in our class. Anybody know who this is? Several of you. This is Tempe Faye Creech Hare, Hare, a first cousin to Joyce and Myrna that I've just shown you. Uh, graduated in 1952 from Seven Springs High School, lives on Paul Hare Road in Grantham today. The road carries the name of her husband, Paul Hare. When you go to Grantham, one of the roads leading off that is the Paul Hare Road. Anyone here ever been to Harker's Island? <laughs> have you ever shot? I don't know why all, that brings all that laughter. When you've been to Hawk and I. But did you know, uh, did you ever shop at a, at a store called Billy's General Store? Billy's Store was only a major store in the island. Billy Best, the owner, is a great grandson of the murder couple. Uh -huh. All of the best living down there on that island are descendants. They're the cousins. But anyway, <laughs> but Billy's mother was Holly. Her grandparents were the killed, the both that were killed and murdered. Holly lived to be a hundred years old and uh, and lived out most of her life around Morehead City. From the final pages of the book, I wrote this slogan. Due to their untimely deaths, James and Effie were robbed of the opportunity to opportunity to raise three baby girls to maturity. They were denied the privilege of sharing the love of 36 grandchildren and 57 great grandchildren. Later generations are too numerous for an accurate accounting, including you guys. And should, by the grace of God, their des next destination be heaven. Could there be a reunion bringing throngs together? Matilda, Paul Frantz, and Lula were separated as children, but are they still? Some deeply spiritual thinkers among their offspring do believe that families can be together forever. What a wonderful thought. And with that, anybody have any questions or comments? I'd be glad to hear from you.